Hi team, today we're going to talk about epigenetics. Epigenetics refers to covalent modifications of DNA itself or the histones around which DNA is wound. These covalent modifications affect gene expression and they can be heritable, but importantly, they don't change the DNA sequence. So when we think of genetics, that's our DNA sequence, epi means above. Epigenetics refers to changes uh, above the DNA, changes that regulate the DNA, but doesn't actually change the DNA itself. And some of these epigenetic modifications can be heritable. There are three types of epigenetic tags that we'll talk about today. The first two are modifications to the histone proteins around which DNA is wrapped. And you can see I'm showing you here a lysine amino acid, and this is the side chain for lysine. Uh, and when we methylate a histone, we add a methyl or a CH3 group onto the lysine of the histone. Okay, so we've methylated that histone. Another option would be to acetylate the histone. Okay, so again, I'm showing you lysine that ends with a nitrogen group, and acetylated lysine has an acetyl group stuck onto the end of the lysine molecule. There are a couple of different proteins that can be involved here. These are reversible processes. We can have methyl transferases or demethylase enzymes. Here we can have uh, acetyl transferases or acetyl deacetylase enzymes. These are reversible processes that modify the histones. We can also directly modify the DNA itself. So typically the base which is modified is cytosine, the C base. And we do that by adding a methyl group to it. So this is DNA methylation. And when we encounter a region of DNA that's highly methylated, this is sometimes called a CPG island. And you already know that C can be hydrogen bonded to G, but a CPG is referring to when C is phosphodiester bonded to G in the DNA backbone. So that's what we're seeing here. CPG, C next to G, is methylated. C next to G is methylated. C next to G is methylated. They, it looks like they forgot this one. This one's gonna be methylated too. What's kind of nice is because if we have a C next to a G on one strand, we know we're gonna have a C next to a G on the other strand of DNA, so we're gonna get both strands to be methylated. Okay. We can talk in another video about how the modification of histones affects gene expression. Suffice it to say here that acetylation of histones leads to active transcription. That is acetylation of histones, acetylation active. This is going to open up the DNA structure and allow transcription to occur. Methylation, on the other hand, methylation equals maybe. Some histone methylations lead to open and active transcription. Some methylations of the histones lead to closure of the DNA and inhibition of transcription. Let's talk next about what happens when we have methylation of the DNA. We're looking at two sequences here. On the left, we've got a promoter region, and on the right, a gene body or the coding region of the gene. In the gene body, there's not very many CPG bases. 
In the gene body, you can see it's fairly rare. Um, so I'll call this the rest of the genome. And the CG, CPG occurrence is less than 1%. In the, inside the gene, it's okay for CPG to be methylated. That happens regularly. However, in the promoter, we've got a CPG island that is more than 10% of the bases are C and G. And if a gene is being transcribed, then CPG is not methylated. But if we have methylation of the promoters, this can actually lead to silencing. Recall that a transcription factor is going to be on the lookout for its consensus sequence of DNA, bind to it, and help call RNA polymerase to start transcription. However, if each of these cytosines is uh, modified with a methyl group, that's going to change what the DNA structure looks like to a protein that's trying to bind for it. So instead, this transcription factor won't bind. We're not going to have transcription if we have methylation of CPG islands in the promoter. Okay, let's talk about an example of this. Our example of epigenetics is going to uh, really demonstrate one of the amazing opportunities that epigenetics provides for the body. That is, it provides a link between our DNA and our environment. A link between our nature and our nurture. So in mice, as well as in humans, we have stress signaling. So stress signals from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland and ultimately stimulates the adrenal glands on top of the kidneys to release the stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. Cortisol can bind to a glucocorticoid receptor in the hypothalamus and signal all clear. And this is going to sort of relieve the, the stress response. Let's talk now about um, a scientific study that was described in Nature Reviews Neuroscience. I'm going to have us first look at this second mouse. Here we have um, a parent mouse, a mother mouse, who treats her babies by high licking and grooming behavior. She's taking care of them. And what this means is that the NGF1A transcription factor can bind to the NR3C1 gene, ultimately expressing the glucocorticoid receptor. So this is our gluco corticoid receptor and the consequence for those babies is that um, they're able to turn on the all clear signal they're going to experience low corticosterone levels these babies will have low anxiety and when they grow up to have their own pups they will display high licking and grooming activity because this transcription factor is able to bind to the promoter and turn on the glucocorticoid receptor. Now, in contrast on the left here, we've got mice who, for whatever reason, or rather these are rats, who for whatever reason are showing low licking and grooming behavior to their offspring. These mice are, these rat pups are somewhat neglected. The consequence of that is that we have methylation of the CPG islands in the promoter of this gene. So the transcription factor is no longer able to bind. We don't have transcription of this glucocorticoid receptor. And so it's hard for the cells to signal the all clear. 
The consequence of that is that these mouse babies, they're rats, darn it. These rat babies have high stress hormone levels. They have high anxiety. And when they grow up to have their own pups, they show low licking and grooming behavior, repeating the cycle over again. And this was demonstrated to also be true in humans 10 years ago, more than. So a question we should ask is, why does this epigenetic change, that is methylation of the CPG islands in the promoter, why does it lead to changes in behavior? Well, you can see that this epigenetic change is not just affecting transcription factor binding. It's not just affecting the DNA. It's actually affecting the genes that are expressed from the DNA. And because we're connecting now our DNA to some phenotype, right, um, we're seeing an influence of that epigenetic change on the actual behavior of the organism. Now, this could be an example of adaptive behavior. If you're in a high-stress environment, if you, for example, um, if you are a rat in the wild and you don't have a parent because you live in an urban environment and rats don't have a very long lifespan, it might be quite adaptive to say um, that these rat pups who are experiencing low licking and grooming need to be high anxiety. They need to be on the lookout for um, stressors, predators, danger in their environment. And that's going to increase their fitness and make it more likely that they survive to adulthood to be able to reproduce themselves. The consequence of that, however, is that this is a cycle where if the offspring receives low looking and grooming, they pass on low looking and grooming, and consequently they're going to be passing on this um, methylation of the glucocorticoid receptor. Next, we're going to talk about a model used to study epigenetics. And that is the agouti model in mice. So first of all, let's look at this gene on the top where we have a hair cell specific promoter, which turns on expression of the gene agouti, which codes for fur color or hair color. If we have a dominant A allele, we're going to produce pheomelanin, that is yellow hairs. And if we have a little a, little a recessive genotype, um, we'll just produce eumelanin, which is brown hairs. Okay. However, in the agouti epigenetics model, we also have an insertion in the promoter region. And this insertion of IAP carries a constitutively active promoter so that we're no longer only expressing agouti in hair-specific cells, we're also expressing agouti everywhere. The consequence, for whatever reason, of expressing agouti everywhere in the body is that these agouti mice have obesity, diabetes, and a predisposition towards cancer. Now, interestingly, CPG methylation inversely correlates with agouti expression. That is, if we have increased methylation, we have decreased agouti. And Within a population of mice, you can have variation in the methylation of the IAP promoter, leading to varying expression. Now, all three of these mice shown at the bottom here are heterozygotes. Which mouse has the most methylation of its genome? Remember that methylation is going to silence the agouti locus. 
And up here, when we have expression of agouti, we tend to have yellow hairs. So that means this mouse has high agouti expression. This mouse has low agouti expression. Um, and that means we're going to have low agouti, we're going to have high methylation. Over here we have high agouti, we have low methylation of the promoter. And the mouse in the middle has a medium amount. Some cells have high methylation and some cells have relatively low methylation. So this mouse, which is brown, is showing us the highest level of methylation. It's completely silenced expression of agouti in all cells thanks to methylation of this promoter region. Another fact to share is that diet can affect the epigenetic state of your DNA. It can affect the methylation level of your DNA. So here we have a pregnant agouti mom. She's heterozygous. And she's fed a diet that's either rich in methyl groups or a regular mouse diet. And we'll cross this mom heterozygous with a heterozygous dad. Now, if we're fed, if the mouse is fed regular food, we're going to expect to see um, a double homozygous or a homozygous individual, two heterozygous individuals, and a homozygous recessive individual. The homozygous recessive individual is going to um, going to be brown no matter what. Doesn't have the agouti locus. The homozygous dominant individual only has the agouti locus. Uh, but these heterozygous offspring are going to look more like the mother because they'll be in poorer health. They're going to be highly expressing the agouti locus with regular mouse food. If we look at the offspring um, from the same cross in a mouse fed with methyl groups, we're going to have the same genotypes. A mouse who's homozygous dominant, a mouse who's homozygous recessive, and in the heterozygotes, they're going to have highly methylated DNA. So we're going to be silencing the agouti locus, thus the offspring are going to look predominantly brown because agouti is silenced. It's important to note that um, the diet that this uh, mouse is eating is affecting not only the agouti locus, but the entire genome. It's just that we're able to use agouti as a readout to represent what's happening at the whole genome level. You can think of agouti as the reporter that reports on what's happening with methylation at the whole genome level. The last thing we want to look at thinking about epigenetic regulation of DNA includes another study of epigenetics in mice using the agouti model. Here at the top again, we've got mice who are all heterozygote, but they have varying degrees of methylation on their DNA. We're looking at two figures from a paper by Dolanoy 2007 published in PNAS. And they looked at um, BPA or bisphenol A in plastics and then measured how it affected the phenotype of mice who were fed this diet as prenatal babies. So let's look first in D. We're looking, we're grouping the mice into five phenotype categories, their fur color. And on the y-axis, we're sort of reading out the methylation level of the DNA specifically at that agouti promoter. 
And they looked at four different tissues within, within each of these mice. They looked at tail, brain, kidney, and liver. So they've measured the methylation in the five different phenotypes of mice. Okay, there's thing one. Thing two is they looked at the percentage of offspring in each of the five phenotypic categories. The category that looks fully agouti, and then this category over here, pseudo agouti, and we're calling them pseudo agouti because we know we have that they have the heterozygous genotype, but in fact they look brown, so they're pseudo agouti. The questions the authors wanted to ask is what effect does BPA in plastics have on genome methylation? We're using, uh, to answer question two, we're using uh, agouti to be a readout for um, methylation of the entire genome. How can we interpret these graphs? You might want to pause the video for a second and take a look at them. Think about what effect BPA has on genome methylation. Let's first take a look at graph D in the upper right hand corner. You can see that the mice with yellow fur have the lowest methylation levels. Uh, that's consistent with what we described previously, where if we have big A, little a genotype, yellow mice have low methylation levels, so we're able to express the agouti coloring and show a yellow phenotype. Mice that are pseudo agouti still have the heterozygous genotype, but we have lots of methylation, so across the entire genome really, so that um, we're not expressing the agouti locus, and we see the brown color. So we have higher methylation in the brown mice we have low methylation in the yellow mice. All right, if we look at figure 1B here, let's look at the distribution of coat colors in the offspring of mice fed with a control diet versus a diet rich in BPA. In a control diet, we've kind of got a... Uh, it's not even a normal curve, it's kind of an equally distributed curve across all of the different phenotype categories. But you can see mice who are fed a diet with BPA have a shift toward the left in terms of phenotypes. We have a shift toward the more yellow phenotype. And if we reference up here, we know that the yellow phenotype occurs because we have low methylation of the genome. So BPA shifts us to a lower level of methylation than a control diet. Well, what is BPA? BPA is bisphenol A. It's found in many plastics, from plastic water bottles to Tupperware containers to even the receipts you get from a gas pump at the gas station are coated in BPA. BPA is everywhere in our environment, and it's affecting the methylation of our DNA. This is just one of the compounds that could be leading to wholesale changes in our genome methylation. And this is just an example of something that reduces methylation. Probably many of the chemicals that we're exposed to could increase methylation of our DNA as well. So we've got an environmental signal that's leading to changes in gene expression thanks to epigenetic tags like methylation of DNA. Really cool stuff. All right, if you have more questions about epigenetics, I look forward to chatting with you on Monday to talk more about 
this process.